you everybody for being here. Are you guys having fun today? Okay, I mean, that's what you expect from this kind of crowd, right? Um, so let me be, again, welcoming you probably for like the 10th or 11th time to the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference 2023. Um, this is a competitive, competitive advantage talks presented by Kager, also known as the Crafts Analytics Group. My name is Diego Carrasquillo. I'm a first year MBA student, part of the content team here for the, for the conference. And it is my pleasure to introduce the presentation, The Next Revolution of AI in Sports, Large Language Models Presented by Stats Perform. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Patrick Lucy, Chief Scientist at Stats Perform to the stage. Okay, thank you. Do you hear me okay? Um, perfect. Well, uh, as introduced, my name's Patrick Lucy. I'm Chief Scientist at Stats Perform. Uh, and today I'm gonna to talk about something which has been in the press recent. Um, so in the press recently, it's around large language models. Um, so today I'm just gonna quickly go through what they are, and more importantly for this audience, how it applies to sport. So as most of you would be aware, uh, in November 2022, OpenAI came up with ChatGPT, or released ChatGPT. Uh, and at a very high level, you can think of it as the best chatbot you've, uh, you've ever used. So you can put any question in and it comes out with a nice conversational response. So you can think of it as the most intelligent human you've talked to, uh, you ask a question and it'll give this really, really nice response. Um, in addition to this, it solves really the blank page problem in the sense that if you haven't, you don't know how to get started, it can promote some ideas. So it's been really lauded for its creative ability. And it's not just for text, so they've released it for uh, image to uh, text to image. So here in DALI 2, I put in um, a text description such as Leo Messi winning the World Cup for Stoke City on a cold Tuesday night. And it generates this image. So it's not too bad, so it has number 10, has the Stoke City uh, colors, and also you've got the police there and, and, and the rain, so it's not too bad there. Uh, then you have Meta, in the last year came out with um, the text to video. So you put in a text description and it generates this nice video. Now what underpins all of this is something called large language models. Now language modeling is not something new. Language modeling you can think of is just a uh, next token prediction or in the context of natural language, is this predicting the next word or next uh, sentence. Now what's different here is actually predicting, uh, well, the, is the size of the model. So under ChatGPT is uh, GPT-3, and the GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer, um, and that, that denotes uh, the architecture of the model. So OpenAI have that, Google have their Lambda model, I think they've rebranded it BARD. Uh, Meta last week came up with um, their new model, so they released four large language models, uh, but essentially they're similar, in the sense that they're based on this transformer network. So in 2017, Google came out with this paper called Attention's All You Need. And then from that, it's, it spawned all these different um, large language models. And so um, Xavier uh, Armatran from LinkedIn wrote this excellent article, summarized it, and gave the timeline um, on you know, how these have evolved over time. Now, another way to think of these large language models is um, through the lens of foundation models. And this is why I think this is the next revolution. Well, this is my belief. It is the next revolution in sports. And what we currently do in sports is still in the machine learning phase. And what I mean by that is if we have a question or is there a metric we want to create, we craft some features, put in a model, and get an output. Now, that's evolved more recently in sport where we use deep learning. So instead of handcrafting features, we will use convolutional neural networks or even transformer networks to actually learn those features. And that's a way that we can do object detection and tracking really, really effectively. Now, the paradigm shift is actually putting, is actually creating one model, which we call a foundational model, which can do all these tasks. And this is what we're finding with natural language uh, currently. Now, this excellent paper, it's about 200 pages uh, from the Center of Foundation Models at Stanford. They have this really nice diagram which kind of depicts what, what, what's happening here. So instead of having uh, a single model to create an output for each task, we have one model that can do all those tasks. And the really nice thing here is that once you have that foundation model, 
you can fine tune it with your specific data and then you can really answer the questions that, uh, that you want. Now, how do they work? So the intuition is, uh, with these transformer networks, it's essentially learning by taking a word out and then predicting what that missing word is. So instead of using the previous word, it's using the context of all the words in that sentence or the previous sentence, and it's basically making a, a very good prediction there. Now, why there's so much excitement, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Andrew Ning and, and doing his courses on Coursera, the reason why there's so much excitement here is that they work really well. So if we just use machine learning, after a period of time, the amount of data, the advantage kind of drops off. We don't get any improvement. But with these large neural networks, the more data that we get, the performance gets better and better and better. Now, commercially, this is very, very exciting because you know, AI is really useful now. So um, obviously, there's a lot of fuss. If, you, um, if you've signed up in Bing, you can actually use this assistant in the search engine, which, which could be quite disruptive. Um, what OpenAI have done using that fine tuning mechanism so they've created Harvey, so uh, this is an assistive tool to help the legal profession. So instead of spending hundreds of hours just trolling through precedent legal cases, you can just put it into Harvey and it can summarize it uh, for you very, very effectively. Then also there's uh, Copilot, so it can be an assistive tool just to help you code. So a lot of people have used it and they're reporting like a 10 times speed up. Uh, but every day there's something new coming out. And, but this is really the sweet spot for AI. It's helping domain experts do their job better. And that's really what sports analytics is. We need to create metrics to help domain experts make better decisions and do their job better. Now the question is, can we actually use ChatGPT for sports? So spoiler, there's a spoiler alert here. Uh, the answer is no, okay? So currently you can't use it. Uh, a couple of reasons, so just say you put in a question such as who won the World Cup last year? Uh, can't give you an answer because the database that it's trained on is only up to September 2021. Now, if we go, if we ask a question before that, I uh, apologise for this first question. I'm an Australian, I love cricket. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, I watched a documentary on Imran Khan, who was a former Pakistani captain and, and prime minister. And there was a documentary going through how they won the 92 World Cup. So I thought, well, that's a good place to start. Let's ask that question. You can see here the narrative is really good. It gets a lot of the facts right. It gets the date, uh, Pakistan won. Uh, but there's a key thing there. It said, led by an unbeaten century from their captain, Imran Khan. Now, I know cricket pretty well. So I said, I don't remember that. So I went to uh, the scorecard, and it turns out he actually didn't score a century. He scored 72 runs and he got out. Okay? So that's not right. Now, in sport, you have to get the facts right. If you get it wrong, you don't get trust, okay? So you have to get that right. Now, that could just be, you know, uh, uh, a cricket edge case. So let's ask, a, you know, a, a more general question around soccer. So who won the 2019 FA, FA Cup? And who was the player of the match? So these were literally the first two questions. I'm, I'm a bit strange that way, I ask random questions. So again, the, the narrative is really, really nice. Um, you know, Man City won 6-0, Raheem Sterling was the star performer. And I said, well, let's check that, let's go to Wikipedia, let, let, let's check that. Well, yes, City won 6-0, but the uh, man of match was actually Kevin De Bruyne, okay? So it made that up. So I said, regenerate the response. So I did it again, it doubled down on Raheem Sterling. It said, well, he scored in the 38th minute and the 81st minute. And I said, well, let's check that. So luckily at Stats Perform, we have an Opta database, Go to press box live there. Well, he actually scored in the 81st and 87th minute, okay? Well, I click regenerate again. And it said, okay, KDB's the man of the match, okay? So this kind of heightens the importance of knowing what this technology can do, but also what it can't do. And so currently, it can't be used for sport. So there's a couple of reasons. You know, you have to have the up-to-date database, but also these models are generative. And the way that you can think about this is it's not optimized for facts. However, the way that it works is don't let the facts get in the way of a good story, okay? The other thing is this model is trained on natural language. Sport is not natural language. You can learn from reports, but it actually isn't natural language. Sport is constructed. It's a constructed language. And it isn't just text. It's also visual. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to go through that. First of all, I'm going to talk about 
how we can enable chatbots for sport, and then go through the language of sport and how we can expand and scale it. And then the fourth thing is where I, I think this is the revolution, how we can use these large language models to predict everything during a match, but also be an assistive GM, forecast long term, but forecast with all the players involved there. Now, facts first content. Just kind of highlights, when we go, when we check a score, when we check any information, we have to have that trust on the data. So if you go to Google, powered by our data, you need to know that data is accurate. If you look at BBC in the UK, or if you go to a sports book, all that data needs to be up to date. If you go watch sport, you know, on a streaming device, you need to know that's up to date. And then what's important there is all the metrics that we generate on top have to be reliable as well. So you can have live win probability, whether it is team rankings, whether it is tournament predictions, whether it is XG, possession value, whether we're doing any recruitment task, we need to know that that comes from accurate, up-to-date and live data. If it's not up-to-date, if, if, if you miss the last game, well, it, it's kind of pointless. And the other thing too is it has to be available for all sport. For that knowledge base, it has to be available for all sport. It has to be available for tennis. And then we can generate all our predictions for tennis there. It has to be available for cricket and rugby. It has to be available for the US sports. So wherever sports data is consumed, it has to be live and up to date. And again, you know, that's why we're very good at stats perform to do what we do, but you need that data. And another thing too, natural language generation and sport is not a new thing. It's actually been around for 10 years. We've been doing it for 10 years. So a lot of the content that you're consuming, it's actually generated automatically. Now, there's a difference on how we do it. We do it facts first, meaning that you see the story with the facts and you build the narrative around that, okay? So this is not a new thing. However, we're limited here because the language that we use here is limited. So it begs the question, what is the language of sports? Now, I've mentioned this, it's multi-language. So everything that I've shown you is using this kind of metrics. You know, we can map this to a discrete data space. And then from that, we can come up with aggregated data, derived data, we can put metrics on top. And also another thing to note with sport is a hierarchical structure. In terms of stories, we can tell it at the event level, we can tell it at the possession level, we can tell it at the match le level or the season level. Now the analogy to natural language is you can think of an event as a sentence, you think of possession as a paragraph, you can think of the match as a chapter, and you can think of the season as the uh, uh, as, as the book. Now, in terms of the stories that we can tell, we're only telling a slither of that, okay? Because we're only using a fraction of the language available. Now, a key piece of unlocking that is actually using tracking data. Now, tracking data, the kernel of all knowledge, in my view, is video, okay? It's, it's raw information. And what tracking data is doing is compressing that into a digitized form where we can utilize that. And for the last 20 years, it's been around for over 20 years. For the biggest part, it's been used for precision measurement, whether it's officiating, whether it is for broadcasts, where we see the first downline, whether we see visual insertions, and more recently, for semi-automatic offside detection, or in the metaverse. Uh, at the NBA All-Star Weekend, they had this really cool deep fake where you do a 3D scan of a player, and then you can put that player in the actual action. So it's been used to do those precision measurements. However, it's also a key part of the language. Okay, you can think of the events that we have as basically the subtitles in a video, but we actually want to use the pixels as well, and that's what tracking data affords us. And so when we use that, we can basically unlock the full language of football, we can tell stories, we can do better predictions, and that's really the next stage. So I can see, I, I see the precision measurements as an evolution, I see expanding this language as a revolution. But we need to use all that data, we need to have the modeling techniques to actually uh, unleash that. And another key thing is that event data and tracking data has to go together, okay? So for goals and for red cards and substitutions in soccer, you have to get that right 100% of the time. If you rely on automatic technology to do that, that's not gonna cut it. Even if you're 99.9% right, that's not enough. So the way that I see data collection, you have the computer vision data, but the bones of the story is actually the human collection. You need to get those bones right to get that context and then you can get computer vision to, to, to fill in those gaps there. So it's really a hybrid of the human vision system and the computer vision system, and that's how we're gonna get scale. 
Now, the idea here is, well, how can we actually expand and scale this? So, um, we've released this product called Optivision, and it's essentially doing that in uh, Socket. So, the idea with Optivision is we are merging together our event data and our tracking data, but also we're doing that in a scalable fashion. We're doing this live, but in a scalable fashion. And what I mean by that is we do it from an in-venue solution, we have our in-venue solution, or we have uh, any other in-venue solution, but also we're doing this tracking from broadcast. Um, and so from broadcast, that enables us to basically digitize all the games going forward, all the different leagues, but also going back in time. Because once we have that, we can do those comparisons and essentially digitize every game that's ever been played, and that's really our goal. Now, what we see in this video here is that given just what we normally collect, just um, using our event data, which collects the on-ball events, we can augment that by capturing everything that happens off the ball. So it's not just getting the raw positions, we can digitize that or transform that in a way that we can give more color around uh, each pass. So what were the passing options? What's the likelihood of this player scoring or this player uh, completing that pass in that situation? What is the shape of the team? Uh, how many line breaking passes occurred? Uh, what was the pressure on each of those passes? So through, through this Optivision approach, merging event and tracking data together, we can measure all these things. So we're very excited about that, but there are other things that we can do. So we've been doing this for basketball. So this language in basketball has existed for basically the last decade. And what we're doing now is scaling this to every game that's been played, whether that's college or international basketball. So there's two steps here. We, um, we basically refine the play-by-play -play so we can get accurate timing and uh, locations of the end of possession events, but then we can expand upon that by getting ball screens, the coverages on ball screens, off ball screens, we can get the defensive measures on all those situations and we can do that for basketball. And as I mentioned, we scale this via computer vision. So on the left here, we presented this at Sloan a couple of years ago. Um, we are tracking from broadcast and we're getting that XY data. And through Optivision via remote tracking, we're actually doing this every game live, okay? Uh, which we think it's very exciting for us, we get to expand it, but we can tell the full story for every game that's being played. However, when we do that enrichment, we're basically mapping it to a discrete space. A lot of the questions that we have in sport can't be articulated via text. It's example-based. So we did some work during the Australian Open, this is what we did internally. So some of the questions that we have is, what's the likelihood of a player winning this point? Or what's a in this serve, where, where's this player most likely to hit it? In this forehand, is he going to go cross court? Is he going to go down the line? So we need to use that tracking data to ac actually enable us to ask that question, but also the output is visual as well. So it's important that we do that for the men's game, but also we do that for the women's game. Um, it's running short on time here, so there's other things that we've done. At Sloan, I think four or five years ago, we did this ghosting work where the query is, where should this play have been in this situation? It has to be a frame-based query. And so red is the attacking team, blue is the defensive team, and yellow is the ball, and white is where the average team would have been in this situation. You can augment that by saying, well, what is the best team doing in that situation? Or where should those players be to minimize uh, the expected goal value? Um, we do this in basketball as well, where we can actually not only do that ghosting technology, but we can actually use this to fill in the missing gaps. So this is still work in progress, but again, everything's full circle here where um, we can actually estimate where their severe uh, occlusion is. Now, something that I'm really uh, most excited about, and I do think this is the, 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 the biggest revolution that's coming, is the idea of using these transformer networks to predict matches or at the season level. So live win probability has been around for 20 years um, and has different variants, but in a very simple way, uh, how we generate this is get some features, put in a model, and generate an output. Now, where things are going is that you want to make a prediction of every player live during a match, okay? So we want to predict a number of passes, a number of shots, or a um, number of fouls. And so instead of just making one prediction, on field there's 22 players here, okay? So once upon a time, or, or this is currently what's done, you make a prediction, a single prediction of each of those players independently. 
That's not right. The predictions need to relate to each other. So instead of doing a single variable prediction, you actually need to treat this box score as a sequence. Okay? That player name is the first word. Their position is the second word. The number of current passes that have in the third word. And you go through all the players, not only that team, but also the opponents. So it's a rather long sentence there, but you can think of this as a machine translation task, where given that situation, given enough data, you can actually regress what that output is. That's the only way, in my view, you can solve this problem. If you're treating this independently, you're not modeling those interactions. It needs to be done this way, and you can update it instantaneously. Now, that kind of leads us to what I think is the holy grail, being able to create this assistive GM. So with Autostats, we do a really, really nice job. We've tracked over 10,000 games of college and international basketball where we can model um, the historical performances. So based on their college performances, we can map out what their uh, future performances are. Now, this works really, really well. Um, however, the assumption is, is that we don't take in consideration who else is on the roster. Now, I'm on a panel tomorrow with Daryl Murray. I'm going to talk about this a bit more. However, when you're doing this modeling, you have to have all the other players. So this is you know, a, a, a crazy example, but just say the Bulls um, with Michael Jordan drafted Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant isn't going to have the same usage uh, when Michael Jordan is there. So you have to factor in all the different players. Um, and using this transformer approach, you need to represent it that way, and, and then you can do those predictions. So a lot of content there, so thank you for, the, uh, thank you for your patience. But really the key takeaway is um, using ChatGPT, don't use it for sport. You know, just be aware that there are some issues there. The language of sport isn't natural language. You know, it's its own language. Uh, so we have events and tracking data. And then really I see the big paradigm shift is shifting to these foundational models where we need to predict everything at once instead of having each individual prediction. So um, I'll leave it there. I appreciate your attention and happy to answer any questions if we have time. Okay, thank you. So really interesting presentation. We are a little bit short in time here, so we'll take one or two questions to make sure that we have enough time. We'll bring the uh, microphone to you. That was an amazing presentation. Um, I love deep learning. I love the, that it takes the idea and the data and it becomes the central point and not the effort that it takes to get to the solution. Um, my question is, do you think that uh, video is um, good enough for the source of truth or do you see yourself moving into LiDAR and other technologies to get? It's a very good question. So it's around precision measurement and I think for um, obviously, for semi offside detection, you need 12 to 20 cameras. However, it's just not going to scale. Okay. So I see that as basically putting an EKG on someone, putting a bunch of sensors on someone. Now, what we're trying to create is basically the Apple Watch and Fitbit. We need to be able to sensors across all the games that's ever been played. And so it's a matter of scale. You know, you don't need that level of precision to do a lot of the measurements that we're doing. So again, it, it's two dimensions. You go down the precision route where you need to have more sensors. Um, and, you know, for semi-automatic offside detection, they need to augment that with the chip on the ball. Right? Where we're looking at is scale. How can we digitise, and that's the true value of AI in my view, you need to do it across every game. And it's not just the men's game. It needs to be done in the women's game. It needs to be done at the youth levels. So where do you get that scale? And then when you're making decisions such as recruitment or just analytics, you have that data. Uh no, um, and I'm sure, do you have time to like also answer questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so we'll do one more question uh, from like the public sake, but like you'll also have time to stand outside and answer some of your questions. One more question, anybody? No, okay, I guess you can ask your follow-up question if you want. Sorry, sorry, I can't hear you. Derek, can you? Oh, sorry. Um, have you looked at the lottery ticket hypothesis that came out of MIT a few years ago? No, I haven't. Okay. It's basically a way of taking larger um, train nets and um, finding the true, uh, smaller nets in them that work as... Well, that's the whole, you know, that's the whole point of this. So you have those foundational models, so you have that background model, and then essentially you can adapt it to your smaller set there. So that's exactly the point there. Yeah. 
Okay, guys, thank you so much for your attention. Can we give one more round of applause for our speaker here?